Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. We are setting up on Clubhouse, and we are also going, of course, be on our on our restream here. Tomorrow we will be at two o'clock. We have uh, Julia Julia Treblinko Treblinka from uh, 90 Day Fiance. I thought, what an interesting way to get uh, a citizen's perspective on the Russian Ukrainian conflict by talking to people who lived in those countries. And so I'm trying to get a hold of the Ukrainians from that show, and now the, the Russian is going to speak first, and we'll hear what she's got to say. And uh, I'm trying to research her on Instagram, uh, on uh, Wikipedia. It's not that easy. So we'll, we'll see what she's all about. <laughs> and, uh, we were, we're big fans of the show, so I thought it would be an interesting way to hook you know, people that are familiar and sort of interested in that person, maybe interested in some of their opinions about what Let's this. plug the bobblehead. Susan has a bobblehead. Don't forget this. Uh, <laughs> You have one. Do check it out. It's available. Doctor slash shop. shop. Yes. Don't forget. Collector's Susan, item. Susan, I, I think you muted Drew. No, I didn't. Can you hear me now? No. Nope. Drew's uh, muted. Oh no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I promise. Mm. Well, time. Wait. I've been muted. It's back. No, you're there. back. Okay, was I just I, clicked it on and off. Was I muted the whole time? That no, just just out. just for the past few anything. seconds. You're good now. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Anyways, bobblehead, everybody. Drjudo.com. And uh, we have we sent shop. out the winners bobblehead yet? I will. Okay. I haven't done it yet, but Excellent. I will. I promise. Well done. So, we have to so sign the, my point of bringing up Julia and the uh, Russian um, Ukrainian situation, because I, I, I personally, I don't know what to believe. I don't know really what's going on. I thought you get some sort of perspective would be kind of interesting. We are we are trying to expand what we do on this stream and the kinds of topics. So please, if you have any topics you'd like us to get into, please send it to contact at drdrew.com. Uh, Susan gets all that and collates it and looks at it and. Uh, we know we're t getting ideas about what we might I try. Do. And uh, if you have it on the restream here, you have ideas you want to throw out, I'll listen to it as well. And today is in keeping with uh, sort of expanding our horizons. We are speaking with Dr. Elena Wabe, Director of Research at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. She joins us to discuss her research on people who display extraordinary intuition and premonitions. Uh, she is the assistant professor in the department of neurology at Oregon Health and Health Oregon Health and Science University. She's the author of 90 plus peer reviewed publications, a new book, The Science of Channeling, Why You Should Trust Your Intuition and the Force That Connects Us All. I'll introduce her in a second. There's the book. And this is something obviously Susan is red hot on this topic. Do you want to give your position on it? I'm a frequent flyer. And and because we know lots of people with th these abilities. I have um, been trying to observe what folks are doing from an objective perspective, and that's why I'm very interested to see if the stuff I've observed matches up to Dr. Wabe's research. Uh, we're also going to be visited for a few minutes by Colby Rebel, international psychic medium, certified master spiritual teacher, podcast host, three-time best-selling author. She owns the Colby Rebel Spirit Center in Los Angeles, been featured on a lot of TV and radio shows and here uh, to book a reading, view her courses, or to learn more about Colby, visit her website, Colby, C-O-L-B-Y, rebel.com. So first, let's welcome Dr. Wabe. Dr. Wabe, welcome to the program. There you are. Wonderful. To Thank you for being today. here. Hello. Yes. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, what I want to do is sort of frame um, what I've been observing without hearing from you yet and then maybe let you talk to Colby a little bit and see what you can mine from her that sort of uh, reiterates what you're finding in your research, perhaps. And let me just say, one of the reasons I became interested in this is that I've noticed, as have many people that do uh, particularly intensive psychotherapeutic interventions, 
that when you're in a one-on-one -on -one encounter on a deep level, whether as the patient or as the caretaker, the kind of information that people exchange one to the other is uncanny. It's uncanny. And, and the psychoanalysts noticed this many years ago and developed the whole field of what they called uh, counter-transference and transference, and they tried to create a structure around it. But my experience of it was on a much more holistic basis where I would have smells and see things or hear music or th thoughts or feelings in my body that were not mine. Because <laughs> I, I, I reckon, I will, because I had decent boundaries also as, as having been a patient, I could recognize these things as not my own. They were being put in me somehow by the patient. And then uh, at the same time, Susan's friends, and we're gonna welcome Colby in here just a second, do this work, uh, a lot and I got to observe what they were doing and I noticed there was a lot of neurological things going on. There were things going on that were not customary neurological uh, phenomenology, let's say. Uh, so let me just let me just frame it as that and and ask you first off, am I on to something here? Absolutely. So everyone, has these intuitive gut hunches, if you will. Like you ask anybody in the world, have you ever had a gut hunch or some sort of intuitive hit that came true? And most people are going to say yes. And we, when we do these surveys asking people if they've had these experiences, the percentages range from somewhere about 10% all the way to as high as 90% of people that we pull have these type of intuitive experiences. So at IONS, we're proposing that, you know, this is an innate capacity that we all have the ability to access our intuition. But what is what you're describing is that it shows up differently for people. It shows up on a spectrum from these intuitive gut hunches that perhaps everyone might have to what Colby might experience is these, you know, more rare psychic mediumship trance channeling type experiences, and then everything in between. So we've coined. And, and, and I'm going to interrupt you. I, I, I want to. Oh, I'm going to let you hold because I, I want to get Colby right in as you as you bring her in just a second. But let me just say though, I I don't think anybody would quarrel with the idea of intuitive hunches because. It has it's clear evolutionary adaptation, right? That we have a, a left brain and a right brain, and you know our, our cognitive sort of uh, sensory present attentional mind doesn't collect everything by any means. And so, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense that we would have a more holistic, intuitive kind of a mm, attunement to the environment that isn't necessarily explicit, right? I mean, if there we had a feeling that there was a leopard nearby clearly evolutionary adaptation that works well <laughs> and we may not see the spots but we got a feeling something was you know going on so let's bring colby in uh and colby uh you know my sort of uh interest in all this and now you've got a real noetic scientist on, on the hook here there you are colby's up at big bear we pulled her off the mountain so thanks for being here <laughs> and, 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 Hi guys. And, and i'm wondering Dr. Wabi, if you have any questions of Colby about her family, because a lot of your stuff is genetic research, and whether her family system would represent in any way some of the, what your research has borne out. Great to meet you, Colby. My question for you would be, when did you first in your life notice the abilities that you practice today? Oh, thanks, Helena. Nice to meet you. Uh, I was four years old. So when I was four, uh, my grandfather came to me from the other side and I had a clear conversation with him and I got up and went and told my mom about it. And what I didn't know at that time was he had passed away about a week before that. And we were young, so my family um, didn't really think we should know yet. But that was my first experience at the age of four. And for me, it just never went away. So whether it was a psychic hit, intuitive, connecting to the other side, um, it's always been there throughout my entire life. And, and yet, and yet Colby, you. you did not 
and Bobby, I'm going to interrupt and, and fill in a little piece here. Kobe spent most of her life in the other side of her brain being an accountant yeah. and, and a financial analyst. Yes. And so I'm wondering mm -hmm. when you were in that world, were you sort of still aware of these things and were they happening to you? You just push them aside. How did that work? Yeah. I mean, what's so interesting, twofold. One is, um, yeah, I wasn't a practicing or professional psychic medium at that point. But I was always receiving information. So I would share things with people. I'd be at a party and would just know things. Um, but also in the accounting world, interesting enough, not really in a consciousness way, um, someone would give me a number or a figure and something would say, mm, that feels a little off or it feels a little too high. And so I'd go back to the client and say, are you sure this is what you want? This feels a little funny. <laughs> So I was really doing it in the accounting world as much as I was doing it in my everyday social living experience as well. And dating experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Wabi, I'll let you take it from here. Sure. That's great. It's wonderful to hear your description um, because you're saying these words like feeling or get a hit, et cetera. And so that, is related to what we call this noetic signature because everybody experiences the intuition in different ways. Some people feel it in their bodies. Some people um, say that they feel it or that they know it, etc. So my next question for you is, as a child, was there anybody else in your family who had similar experiences? Um, was there anyone that you had knew about or when you started having these experiences, you shared it with them and they said, oh yeah, so-and-so had this also. Well, what's interesting is we did not talk about it when I was a kid, but as an adult and as I started to kind of come out of the spiritual closet, as we like to say, um, I began to let my grandmother know, my mother know, my aunt now. And then interesting enough, my grandmother um, would sit there and, and, you know, she's of an older generation, wasn't a real, I think, believer, believer. But what was so interesting is when it was just she and I, she would sit there and tell me how she also would know things. She would always get things. She would have dreams about things and then they would happen. Um, and then my aunt also is also very, very psychic. She'll know things. My mom, too. I got to give my mom credit. My mom will know some things every once in a while or just call me saying, you know, oh, I, I had this dream last night as well. So I've noticed it with my mom, my aunt, my grandmother. And then I do remember my grandmother saying how her mother also um, had these gifts in a way as well. So. You can see that it went back uh, pretty far, which is kind of interesting because we didn't talk about it when I was a kid. But as an adult, we we definitely shared stories and experiences around it. Thank you, Colby. That's great. You know, we've done so many surveys where we ask people if the they have family members with similar experiences and the majority of people say that yes they do and you hear yeah. you know people's subjective reports and anecdotes that these things run in their family but it hasn't really been formally studied um, there was a few studies done in the UK with something called second sight which is you know what some people called premonitions and they found that it did run in families and they actually did what's called a pedigree study where they looked at you know multiple large families they asked them do they have it do they not have it and found that it uh, was an autosomal inheritance which is quite fascinating so that's what really led us to want to do a more formal study looking at genetics because if there is some component um, that shows that it runs in families, then you would imagine that we would be able to see that in through people's genes. Yeah. I'm curious. Hey, yeah. Hey. So we're, go ahead. Well, I'm kind of curious because in my understanding and my training, 
Um, we've always felt that it did pass down from the mother's side. So I'm kind of curious with your studies, uh, did you guys find that at all? Did you find kind of a reoccurrence more on the mother's side versus the father's side, or was it pretty equal for you? In the small pilot study that we uh, completed last year and it was published, it was fascinating because the, all the participants were female. We did not find any male participants that kind of went through our vetting system um, mm. to be in the study. Now, this was a very small pilot study, and I know that there are many uh, males out there who feel that they have these um, abilities and who are professionals at it. And uh, obviously, I on our institute hasn't haven't vetted them, but. I imagine that there's males out there too, but there there is some piece to this gender aspect that you're talking about. In all of our surveys, the majority of them are women. In our small pilot study where we looked at the genetics, they were all women. So we haven't quite figured out exactly what's going on there, but I think there is something to that. Well, Colby, I will let you go back to the hill. I know you've got a snowboard waiting for you right outside the car. So, yeah, no, I'm so jealous. <laughs> thank you for I know we are, you're making us envious and jealous, but but well, thank I want to say something too. Okay. Um, about the male uh, part. Well, of it. Should we should we let Kel, Colby no, go? I think, though? I mean, Colby can kind of back me up on this. Like okay. there are there are yeah, yeah. male clairvoyant mediums. We know a lot of them, but um, yeah, you know, it's it. I think it's less accepted by the males you know in the in socially so it's like it seems like it's more female but i think there are a lot of male males out there who are who are who have the gift they just aren't willing to admit it because it's kind of like not cool men don't like it as much as men. I, I think like it, a majority I, of our followers were always women and then you know but i think the a lot of men are intuitive. They just don't, you know, they don't recognize it or. I, I'm going to, you know. by the end of this discussion with Dr. Wabe, I think we will build an argument that the issue is not the intuition, it's the ability to access and hear it loudly enough to be able to, I, I think it's the corpus callosum that is the, the key ingredient. And women have a huge corpus callosum so they, callosum so they can hear all this left brain stuff, I mean, right brain stuff coming in. Uh, that men can't hear. They Colby, literally, literally are you left-handed or right-handed? I'm left-handed. Okay, so that's another do, factor. On, I think that might have Do you write like this, or do you write like this? I write normal, so I don't write like yeah. this, Drew. If that's what you're saying. Yeah. I okay. don't. Yeah. But, so you're but, true. Okay, tr but let me tell you what. Hand. True left-handed. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but I also I write normal, but. My grandmother is also left-handed. Yeah, right. So you, you have inversion of the inversion, true inversion of the brain brain hemispheres. And, right. Do you and, do and, sports left-handed or right-handed? A lot of a lot of you guys are, are oh, actually ambidextric. I just want to throw this Left, in. Left-handed ambidextric. Is that sort of you too, Colby? Uh yes, exactly. Yeah, I can use yeah. my right hand yeah. as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that that's what I found, and and even sometimes they can write in both directions with both hands and all kinds I, of crazy stuff. I just want to throw that in. Is that you I too, can Colby? write a little. I can write a yeah. little with my right hand. Um, I can write a little with my right hand. Susan, I swing a bat left-handed. I kick a ball right-footed. Um, if I were catching Tennis. a ball, I would throw it left-handed. Tennis, left. Uh, well, tennis is both sides, right? But I would serve left-handed. I would serve with the racket me. in my left hand. Excuse me. <laughs> Le uh, okay. Tennis, tennis would be uh, left hand. The racket's in my left hand. Yeah. So interesting. So we're going to get more into this, and then you're going to have to come have dinner with us or something. We can un we can download. We have all to this do a to calling you. out with Susan. I can't yeah, wait. Do, it's a, been a while. do a pod with Susan. Yeah. Uh, you have a great day on the hill. Okay. All right. All right. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Colby. Thank you. Right. Bye, Helene. Bye, Colby. Nice to meet you. And you can see okay, bye, at, Psych, at, at Colby you, it, and her at Colby Rubble is uh, ColbyRubble.com and uh, also all the Instagram and Twitter and everything else is Colby Rubble. Right, Colby? Is that right? That's, That's right. Yeah, She's exactly. the real deal. Thank you. Okay. She, okay. Thank you, She'd guys. be the real deal. 
I've met right. a lot of psychics, and she's one of the best. So, so let's let's start digging into that. So, so are you finding kind of the laterality issue of the brain hemispheres part of the story? We haven't looked at that yet, but it is a fascinating question. We uh, did a study with trans channelers, which are kind of the extreme case of this intuitive capacity. So trans channelers believe that they are basically acting as a vehicle for supposed discarnate beings. So beings who don't have a body actually use their body to communicate. Now, we can't really prove what the source of that is, if it really is a discarnate being or not, and yet that's what these trans channelers believe. So we brought them into the lab. We hooked them up to um, brainwave measurements, so EEG, heart wave, EKG, skin conductance, blood pressure, respiration, all these physiological measurements, and then we asked them to go into a trance channeling state and then rest trans-channeling rest. They did this a number of times. And we looked at the differences in their brain waves when they were in this trans-channeling state versus not. And we actually didn't see any differences between the sides of the brain, the front to the back, or differences between the trans-channeling states and the resting states. There was no difference in the brain physiology. This was looking at um, brain frequency, so alpha, theta, beta, delta, gamma, etc. We're doing a new analysis right now of interconnectivity, which I think will get at this piece that you're alluding to, that perhaps people who have a greater balance between the two sides of the brain have an easier time of being able to you know, access this information that's beyond their traditional five senses that we might do through intuition or what we call this noetic wisdom if you will and you had mentioned so, evolution earlier go ahead no no you evolution you mentioned evolution earlier yes it makes absolute sense that people that humans who were able to access information beyond their five senses to help them find you know the herd of buffalo or locate the next village in terms of navigation or food would support them in survival. So it makes sense that there would be an evolutionary pressure for humans to have these abilities. Yeah, it, ma it makes sense. So I did a little anecdotal study myself. Uh, you know the uh, Hollywood medium, Tyler Henry, that kid that yes. uh, does lots of readings? So I had him read Steve-O, who was a really serious skeptic, and we wired him up for EEG and did a careful analysis on his EEG function. I can tell you for sure his skin t tone and blood pressure is, is all over the place. He, he is, his heart rate goes way down and he sweats profusely. He actually sweats through furniture. He ruined a chair in our house. <laughs> I sat him down in a silk chair. Yeah, My he, mistake. Just, he sweated through the chair. So he's having this massive bodily-based experience. He is engaged in frontal releasing signs. He's doing this with his, he's sketching with his right hand, which hopefully releases the, the left brain maybe to the right, I, I don't know. It's almost like EMDR, right? It's, a, it's an EMDR type with, without lateralizing it. It's, he's sort of just maybe shutting down the, the left side, I don't know. Um, the EEG did not show that, but the EEG did show and I was with a neuroscientist, and he said he had never seen an EEG like this. When he started reading, he went to into a state of deep sleep and hyper alert attentionality simultaneously. And the and the the um, neurologist said he he'd never seen anything like it. And we actually did sort of a fancy put it through a computer, and we're able to localize it deep in the I think it was the left temporal area, if I remember right. I didn't know quite what to make of it yet, but um, you know, it needs more work, obviously. But does that surprise you that we would see things like that? That's fascinating, and no, it wouldn't. And it reminds me of the studies done with psilocybin, where you know these people are doing, you know, in a psychedelic trip, if you will, in a controlled setting, yeah. and they're having all these, you know, visual, auditory, sensory. Um, 
experiences, but then you look at the brain and the brain is actually more quiet. And so, you know, what you just said is there's this dichotomy between deep, relaxed brain state and yet hyper uh, alertness where this information is coming in. So I'm not surprised. And yet we really are at the beginning of this research. There's so many questions that we have yet to answer about the physiological correlates to being in this state. What is clear is that these experiences are really common to people mm. and that you know most humans have some type of intuitive experiences and it shows up in different ways. Um, and so our goal is to really try to tease apart you know, the, the variation of experiences that people have around intuition. And perhaps there are some genetic components that will say, okay, you get goosebumps, you feel it in your body versus this other person who um, is able to see deceased humans or supposed deceased humans or, you know, has some other expression of their intuitive ability. So, I'm really excited about digging more deeply into that. Back to the evolutionary piece again. So the pilot study that we did, we looked at 14 psychics who were highly vetted in multiple different ways. We interviewed them. We had them do psychic tests online. Uh, we, they did remote viewing and they scored really well. We also had age, gender, and race match control. And we took the genetics of all of those, the DNA samples of all of those people and got their full genome. And we did an analysis to see if there was a difference between them. And what we found was that there was a difference in, not in the coding region. So the coding region is what uh, gets expressed into proteins in the body, et cetera, but on a non-coding region of the DNA. And this was on, on chromosome 7. And this is in an area that um, the gene itself near that non-coding region is highly expressed in the brain. So this was, uh, again, pilot early studies, but really fascinating. And we said, okay, maybe this is just some spurious finding. So let's see if we can uh, look at the larger genetic databases and see what this specific region relates to in these larger uh, genomic databases of data sets that are already collected. So we found that this non-coding region in its original form is actually highly expressed in the population. Greater than 90% of people have the original form of this non-coding region. And I actually need to step back a little bit because the psychics had the original wild type form of this region. The people who didn't have psychic abilities had a mutation. So they had a, um, you know, revised version of this gene. So then we look at these larger data sets, greater than 90% of the people have the wild type original gene. So this supports this notion that we're proposing that all humans have the capacity for this intuition on some level. And the plot thickened a little bit because we looked at, um, we said, okay, if this is actually, you know, a wild type capacity of humans, what would have shifted that over time? Can we look at some relationships? So we said, okay, let's look at the spread of Christianity because we knew that that data was in these data sets. Obviously, there was pressure from, um, you know, the Inquisition, et cetera, to not have these abilities. So perhaps the spread of Christianity would have less expression of the wild type original gene. And we found that that was the case, that the spread of Christianity was actually a predictor of um, having a mutation. The other thing we thought of back at going to this evolution piece again is perhaps the spread of technology would also diminish the wild type. So if you have a GPS, you have your phone, you don't need to use your intuition 
to know where the buffalo is or how to contact the next village over. And that was also right. a predictor, even a stronger predictor than Christianity. So if our original finding was spurious, we would not have seen these really interesting relationships. So I'll stop there because I know I shared a lot. That's a lot of good, great information. It's the uh, the gene was uh, vaporized on the auto da fe on on the steak. That's that's where the gene went. They went up in flames, quite literally, because people that had that ability were did not reproduce and they were burned at the stake. Wow. What was there? A, or they had to hide it. Is there a regionality to it now? Um, no, it was pretty ubiquitous throughout the countries that we um, that were in this global data set. Interesting. So we're really excited to continue this work. There's so many nuances that we still need to understand. Yeah. And, and you said it's non-coding. Is it regulatory or just, just the so-called junk? This, you know, they used to call it junk DNA, right? Now they call yeah. it non-coding. Yeah. Yeah. And so it doesn't yeah. directly um, code for a protein. And yet, you know, we're learning that these non-coding regions have some part to play in um, protein expression. Maybe they, they regulate Regulation. it. Regulation. Regulation. Yeah. So a possible regulation. Okay. That, that makes perfect sense to me. So I got a billion questions. Uh, so, so juicy uh, stuff, huh? Yeah, it's great. It's kind of what I expected. It, it's exactly what I would think. Uh, I, so in addition to my believing there's some laterality to this, meaning, you know, something about being ambidextrous or left handed or being able to release the, the side of the brain that's more associated with the cognition, linear cognition, I also believe there's something, it, there's evidence to me, so I, I hate to use words like belief, the evidence suggests to me that there's something going on in our autonomic nervous system. I've already mentioned how, how uh, Tyler Henry would sweat through, you know, sweat through a chair and they have a low heart rate and something is going, it, this is a, this is on some level, and by the way, the, the part of the brain we're talking about, the intuitive holistic parts of the brain, is more embedded in the body systems. It's the, it's the part of the brain we use before we develop language to communicate our needs to our parents and to you know, have our bodily-based experiences about needing food and whatever. And you know, there's a whole evolving uh, world of interpersonal neurobiology and something called the polyvagal theory, which embeds uh, a lot of our socio-emotional exchange in the body and then goes to the midbrain and the, the nuclei, particularly of the, the uh, vagal nerve, and send it up to the thalamus and the higher regions. D do you have any information about the bodily-based and autonomic component of this, or is that all just me just musing out loud still? No, I don't think so. There is quite a bit to that, and I have a number of things to share about what you just said. So number one, there have been multiple physiological studies looking at people doing various uh, intuitive type experiences from you know, telepathy to mediumship to trans channeling. And in terms of the autonomic activation, it's mixed. So in some studies, we see that there is greater parasympathetic activation. So they're more in rest and relax. They're getting into a very uh, relaxed body state. And that is what allows people to say, do better on laboratory tasks or, you know, receive various information. On the other hand, you have, um, you know, trans channeling, some mediumship studies actually show sympathetic activation. So you talked about um, William Henry, who was doing the, the, you know, moving his hand and sweating through. So there's obviously some sympathetic activation going on yeah. there when yeah. he was having yeah. that experience. So I don't know if there's one clear-cut answer about that, and it may depend on the type of uh, experience that they're having. Back to this whole body-based piece. Go ahead. Yeah. No, well, I'm going to say I want you to go back to the Department of Neurology and challenge them to explain why the autonomic nervous system is organized the way it is. What, why, what are those <laughs> – 
You know what I mean? What are those nuclei doing along the spine that manage the sympathetic nervous system? And what are these giant, what some cultures call chakras, these parasympathetic webs doing in the middle of our body and over our chest? And what are they doing? And do they have receptive capacity? I'm going to bet they have some sort of receptive capacity. They're like little brains. They're, we have brains distributed throughout our body in a weird way. So please take that back to neurology and challenge them to come up with an explanation of what is going on because they have no freaking idea. But go ahead and, and tell me what, uh, what you were about to say. Yeah, before I do, that's a great question. And yes, we'd love to know the answer of that. One study we're actively working on now is uh, cr we created a, a biofield quantum number generator array to be able to objectively measure what's going on in the body. You mentioned the chakras, et cetera. We'd love to be able to have an objective measurement tool to be able to see what's, what's going on in that energy field. So stay tuned for that future study. Um, back right. to the body field, though, because I think this is really important. You know, one of the, the strongest evidence in this field is with a paradigm called the Distant Mental Intention of Living System, or DMILS for mm. short. And this is a series of experiments that were done when you took pairs of people, you put one person in a shielded, electromagnetically shielded room, they were all hooked up to physiological um, measurement devices, then you took another person, put them in a completely separate room, another part of the building, and they were also hooked up to the same devices. And let's call that person the sender, if you will. They looked at a computer screen. Every time the picture of the person, their paired person came up on the screen, they would direct their positive intention towards them. And uh, the receiver, if you will, was just sitting there relaxing for this, you know, 20 minute, 30 minute period. And the sender would alternate between sending intention and not sending intention. And what we found is that the physiology of the pair of the receiver shifted when the sender was directing their intention at them. So they were, their body was actually picking up on the intention being sent from the other room and that this happened instantaneously. So as soon as the sender was sending, the receiver's body physiology shifted. So this type of paradigm has been done over and over again, multiple labs throughout the world. It's pretty um, rigorous findings. So that's really fascinating when you think about the body as a receptor for information that's beyond our five senses why would the body know that my pair across the building was actually directing their positive intention towards me and yet it does so it's quite fascinating there's another set of studies done about staring so have you ever been like in a cafe or in a crowded room and then all of a sudden you turn around and you notice that someone's actually staring at you or looking at you has yes. that ever happened to you Dr. yes Bruce? yeah so this is a very well, I, very common I, I had a i had a i had a really weird experience when i was a when i was nine years old we were driving in a city and happened to drive by my my fifth grade teacher he had, i just finished my fifth grade year and we were you know driving by and out of this building came my fifth grade teacher maybe 40 yards away and my parents went, oh, look, there's, your, there's Dr. Mr. Renee, and there he is. And he he looked around like somebody just screamed his name. It was like the weirdest thing to, to watch him like start to look like, what 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 was that? Who's that? And we were, part, we were at a stoplight 40 yards away, and he was just walking out of a building with his, his eyes directed completely in the other direction. That was very, that, I always remember that. So I, I had that experience when I was 9, 10. Yeah. Right. So people experience that in their daily lives all the time. And this has actually been tested in the laboratory. So where they have starers staring at people, you know, through glass that they can't see, etc., or even through closed circuit TV. And the person who's being stared at can tell when they're um, being stared at. So the body has Weird. some... I'm, I'm imagining cats of prey... 
I, I think birds I think birds can feel that too. I've noticed the birds I, we have a lot of birds in our backyard and I've noticed if I'm looking out the window at, at them f and they're not looking at me, they behave they start to behave differently right away. They freeze. A and I, I, I think that it makes makes well, evolution generally makes sense. That seems like a, a skill that from an evolutionary perspective you'd want to have when a, again, if a leopard's staring at you, you'd want to feel that. So get out of the way very very quickly yeah. absolutely and and by the way this so is this is more sensory sensory based but we had a mountain lion in our backyard that my son got t you know faced off with and it 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 f the stare of the mountain lion froze my son's body he couldn't move and we we talked to some other animal experts and they go oh yeah everybody first thing they will tell you when they encounter one of the Southern California mountain lions is the, the stare. The stare has a, a, an effect on them that they can never shake. They never forget it. And actually, my son felt like the animal was talking to him. Like he like could hear like words like, we're cool. We're good. Don't move. <laughs> don't, don't move. We're, I'm, I'm just cruising through. <laughs> so isn't that funny? That's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's wonderful. I'm, who knows? We don't know. Perhaps that was true. We don't know. That's right. We don't know. That's right. I think a healthy it. humility wow. is, is important here. Yeah, it's it's important yeah. here. But um, did you finish what your point was? Because I have one other, I want to get to another topic. Yeah. One last piece about the body thing. So I mentioned the noetic signature. We've done a whole series of studies now about the individual expression of these intuitive capacities. And we've just recently uh, developed what we call the noetic signature inventory. And it maps onto 12 different characteristics of people's noetic signature. Intuition, um, you know, mind-to-mind -mind communication, knowing things through dreams. And related to the body, there's a few uh, factors that are related to the body. So I mentioned goosebumps. So that's one of my kind of knowing is I get goosebumps when I'm trying to make a decision and the one that feels more true to me, if you will, I get goosebumps all over my body. And many people have shared that they have similar experiences. The other one relates to what you mentioned in terms of counseling appointments. There are some people who actually feel the sensations of other people's bodies. So, you know, for example, friends might be driving in the car and one of the friends says, you know, wow, my knee is like killing me. It wasn't killing me before I got in the car with you. What's going on? And the other friend says, oh, you know, I just had a sprain in my knee that just happened to me. So there's this um, human experience of actually picking up other people's physical sensations, which is one of the things, and emotional also, emotional um, feelings that are not my emotions, picking up actually other people's emotions. It's a little different than just empathy, where we, you know, empathize with other people's emotions. It's actually feeling the other people's emotions. And you mentioned that at the beginning of our talk today. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that good, in-depth, uh, attuned therapy always includes a lot of that. Um, and that's how people develop, uh, frankly, attunement to their own emotional landscape and then boundaries with others. They learn to distinguish on a deep level what's mine, what's yours. That pain in the knee, for instance, some people who are not, that have sort of porous boundaries may confuse that as their pain because it feels like your pain. But uh, you have to be able to be very tuned into your own system to, to ferret that out. So um, I have to take a little break. Uh, I, I want to bring up a couple other things. One is I, I want to express some skepticism in the sense that the cognitive sciences might have a different way of interpreting all this, right? They, they, they might see this as memory distortions or cognitive distortions of various types that are sort of embedded in temporality and therefore sort of interpreted you know, retrospectively in ways that are maybe different than the reality of what's going on. And and we do have a sort of a forward looking nature in our brain where we're trying to re recreate the future, you know, understand the future and sort of how the brain works. So I, I'm wondering how you would respond to that. Uh, and then I want to tell you a little more about some of the other neurological symptoms I've seen, like what I've seen Colby do 
that that some of these women that I've seen do these readings, when they they have, n- n- I don't want to describe a non-normative neurological um, expressions when they're in the middle of it. Much much like Tyler is, you know, low heart rate and sweating, and they do other stuff. And we'll get into that. And we'll also take some calls. So let's take a little break. And we're here with Dr. Alane Wabe. You can find out, follow her at, at dr Wabe W A H B E H. And uh, we'll be back right after this. Since the beginning of the pandemic, nearly one in five Americans has reported consuming an unhealthy amount of alcohol. Could be you, but only 10% of them are actually getting the help they need. Reframe is a neuroscience-based smartphone app that helps users cut back or quit drinking alcohol altogether. Using evidence-based tools, techniques, and content, Reframe guides users through a personalized program to help them reach their goals. Comprised of daily tasks, a comprehensive toolkit, a community forum, and accountability guides, Reframe is a modern, accessible, and affordable resource that can help anyone looking to reevaluate their relationship with alcohol. Reframe is backed by Harvard University and Emory University Schools of Medicine, and it is ranked the number one alcohol reduction smartphone app worldwide with over 350,000 downloads. With Reframe, there's no stigma, just science, no labels, just support. To learn more, go to joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Use the code Dr. Drew for 25% off your first month or your annual subscription. That's at joinreframeapp.com slash Dr. Drew. Let's talk about our friends at Hydrolyte. I can't say enough about Hydrolyte. You hear me talk about them all the time. It gets me through workouts and medical procedures and colonoscopies and COVID. It absolutely contributed to my recovery from COVID. Hydration is key to feeling healthy, and there's never been a time when that could be more important. We're in the height of cold flu season. Every headache has got you testing for COVID. Staying hydrated can keep the questionable symptoms at bay, and there's nothing better than Hydrolyte to get it done. Taking their hydration formula one step further, now there is Hydrolyte Plus Immunity. It starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients. Plus, each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water to make a great-tasting drink that is a 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all-natural flavors. It's gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy, or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. That is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash Dr. Drew. And be sure to use that code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. Back with Dr. Elane Wabe. I want to mention something really quick uh, Susan, as we come out us. of the break. Um, so last year, Hillsides did their annual gala, mm-hmm. and we had a lot of people that, you know, our followers bought some things there. They're going to do another virtual uh, virtual auction. So mm-hmm. you can, you know, if you can't make it to the ball, which I'm not going to make it, so I'm going to go on there too and probably buy some stuff. But okay. um I'll, I'm going to put the link. It's, um, I guess I, I'm going to have to put this out, but I'm going to put it on locals and I'll mm. probably also put it like, I'll put it in the stream right now. I guess you can register and, and get on, get in on the bidding and get some money out there for the foster kids. So, yeah. So Hillsides is a therapeutic, uh, educational living environment for kids that have been abused. It is, it is sensationally high quality and it's all supported by the community. And so whatever you can do to, to help them, we've been supporting them for literally decades and uh, could not could not be a better place to put your resources if you're interested in really making a difference. So, Also, I'm really glad we're having this conversation on 22222. Yeah, wild, huh? Spiritual numbers I today. You were gonna, I wonder if you were going to pick that up. Oh, uh, yeah. I guess we could talk about numbers, but we'll, we'll, let me get some other stuff first. Um because there is a, we should talk to a mathematician about the spirituality of numbers. There, there is some weird quality to numbers, but, but um, the I, I've talked about sort of you know again autonomic and bodily based changes. I've seen the other thing I have noticed is there is something going on with eye movements. 
Uh, and again, in, in the day and age of, uh, you know, uh, EMDR, eye movement, uh, reprocessing, desensitization therapies, the idea of eye movements getting us into part of the brain is a sort of um, common thought now, right? A and uh, I noticed they tend to look up and to the right for whatever that's worth. And again, up and to the right, mm, it can be a lot of things, but that's what I've noticed. But they also develop rapid movement that looks non-physiologic to me and has a rotatory and a stack. Well, Colby once, I watched her, she was reading Susan once and was talking to you about your old boyfriend and it was so accurate, it made Susan uncomfortable and she was trying to trying to like push it off. Like, no, 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 I don't need to hear anymore. I don't want and, to talk to that guy. And she was like, yeah, 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 yeah that's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> And I was watching Colby he was sexually harassing me on the show. And yeah. I was watching Colby very carefully during that. And she not only had this sort of unnaturally rapid eye movement with right upper dominance, right upper quadrant dominance, but she also had rotatory nystagmus. Your eyes can do this. Your eyes can roll side to side. And she had that. And I, I've never seen that in an awake person. And I was like, wow, that that is interesting. Uh, it's something. I don't know what. What do, what do you make of it? It is quite fascinating. I mean, you talk to some mediums and they actually set up their sort of intuitive frame. And they say, okay, if I look in this um, corner, then that's going to be you know, from the mother's side of the family, if I look on this side, it's going to be the father's side of the family. And they have this, you know, schema for where um, these supposed beings show up in their frame. And that's, you know, if they look there, then that's giving them information. You also look at trance channelers, their mannerisms are so incredibly different to their normal state. And we were, you know, pretty mm -hmm. shocked that we didn't see any changes in the normal frequency EEG. So we're really fortunate. We have Arno Delorme, who is one of the creators of EEG Lab, world-renowned open source uh, computer software to analyze uh, brainwave data. So we're looking at some different types of analysis techniques, looking at interconnectivity, looking at um, entropy in the brain state rather than the basic, you know, kind of clinical frequency analysis that that we've been looking at in the past maybe there's some you know different layers that are not revealing these changes that might be related to these eye movements as well very very weird and interesting um the the what about my uh, skeptical challenge that this is actually some sort of actual <laughs> cognitive distortion of course yeah it has it has adaptive you know we're not doubting it's adaptive um you know evolutionary advent advantageousness but maybe it isn't what we think it is absolutely your question is really on this crux of the current dominant paradigm that we are in which is materialism or physicalism which proposes that our consciousness is limited to our physical brain that our brain and its um, workings are what creates our consciousness when you think about being able to notice someone staring at you you know from across a room or feeling someone's intention from across a building that doesn't fit in that paradigm there's you know people say well that's impossible like that can't happen in a materialistic paradigm if our consciousness is just stuck in our physical brain. Now, what's interesting is that there's more and more physicists, philosophers, cosmologists, there's people in multiple different disciplines who are saying that, you know, materialism explains a lot, but it doesn't explain everything. And in fact, a model in which consciousness is not limited to our physical brain, but is actually more fundamental, explains what we are observing in our daily lives and also through experimentation. And so we're moving into this post-materialistic paradigm that holds that consciousness isn't, is fundamental that would leave room for 
some of these things that we're experiencing to be plausible. So that's what What's I would say. What's the guy's name? That that ha yeah. What is, is this? Is this? Are you hearkening from, or we should reference this guy if people are interested in this, that has sort of a Leibnizian monad quality to building consciousness from you know fundamental particles. Uh, what do you? What is his name? There's multiple people. There's, you know, Dan Hoffman. Uh, there's Thomas Campbell. There's Bernard Carr. There's multiple people who are developing theories to kind of explain this consciousness fundamental piece. Um, so, and, you know, and again, we're I not we're not just it, talking about. Uh, I, I mean, you're not just talking about the so-called hard problem, right? Know. You're talking about something completely fundamental to the universe which is a little bit different than the so-called hard problem right right i mean we kind of joke in our lab that we have little c consciousness which is us being awake or asleep and then you have big c consciousness which is even bigger than all of that and you know at ions you know our guiding premise is that we are all interconnected and we see that from you know, the Big Bang, at the time of the Big Bang, we are all interconnected. We have all these experiments looking at entanglement, entangled photons, entangled buckyballs. There's growing evidence showing us that we are actually all interconnected. And if that's the case, whether it's consciousness being fundamental, there is this um, connections between us that allows us to know information that goes beyond our five senses that goes beyond time goes beyond space and the clearest way that i think people can use to help understand this are the practical applications of this for example you look at stargate which was a hugely funded 20-year military covert program where they trained soldiers to actually do these skills and they had, you know, hundreds of actionable um, campaigns, if you will. I don't know if that's the right word, where they received information that they couldn't possibly know in any other way besides these soldiers doing something called remote viewing, where they actually, you know, tuned in, if you will, to a distant location and received very accurate information about specific, you know, places in Russia and submarines. Um, so that whole program, I think, is a really great example of our consciousness being non-local, that it's not limited to our physical brain, but it actually could gain information from very distant targets. Another great application is in archaeology. So there have been a number of archaeological digs that have used people who can use remote viewing to find um, sites, to find ruins that nobody knew about. And yet these, you know, remote viewers, these people who use this non-local consciousness capacity were able to find them. There's even people who have made money through the stock market by using these um, abilities, these intuitive capacities, and they actually made money. So part of me feels like, you know, we can argue and argue about, you know, philosophical theories, and yet when it comes to actually implementing it in our daily lives, having practical applications to our non-local consciousness, that's what is going to really move things forward. And People won't be able to deny it anymore because you're like, oh, okay, I just, you know, was able to do this. How are you going to explain that without having a uh, post-materialistic understanding to our world? I'm, I'm still not willing to let go of materialism because because th there still could be a physics. Ex I mean, it could be something about space time. I mean, it could be a lot of stuff that does have a. And, and by the way, our sense of materialism might shift and change into something kind of different as time goes on, as physics goes deeper. I, I, I don't know. I, I agree. I don't. I'm not. I don't think anyone is saying materialism is all wrong and needs to go away. It absolutely explains a lot about how our world works, and yet 
I don't think it explains everything. So it's about, you know, extending our understanding, if you will. And in terms of the brain and how the brain works in relation to consciousness, I don't, I don't feel that our consciousness is limited to the physical brain. We just see so much overwhelming evidence um, that it's not, that we can actually perceive things beyond our five senses. And see, I don't, I don't put that in the realm of consciousness so much as some sort of shared information that is, I mean, our brain is a very wonderful, amazing instrument, but it is limited. And so my guess is there's stuff that we just, I mean, just look at infrared light. I mean, we just can't see stuff. There's, you know, there's all kinds of things we can't see and don't know about and we, and all kinds of things. And, and I think that's where we're going to find some breakthroughs that still will be connected to the physical universe, but there's stuff that way outside of our sort of ability, our little brain's ability to kind of grasp, I suspect. Absolutely. Um, let's take, right. yeah, let, let's take. Let's take some calls here. Susan, anything before I go to the phones? No, go ahead. Okay. This is uh, Missy. Let's see if Missy's still there. I know people have been on hold and had their hands up for a little while. Um, yeah, Casey Gates is talking about how just that very, very weird fundamental f um, study of physics that, you know, a, a – a particle and a wave people matter can take a part you know a particle or a wave state depending on being observed and even if it's a dummy observing it it can shift it from from particle to wave uh missy you seem not to be there uh nope gone um and so i will bring josh in here if i can get him up all right Hey, Josh, go ahead. Hang on a second. Very, very low. It's me. It's my, it's my phone. Go ahead, Josh. Okay. Yeah. So, so my thing about this is what can this do to help a person who, say, is suffering? I use mm -hmm. the word suffering mm -hmm. because I don't know what else to use for it. Great question. Um, Great question. And I think I just wanted to say something really quickly to sort of frame that better. Um, it's just that we have psychology and we have psychic mediums and i think both can be used um for the person and it might be just about finding what is better for that individual whether it's psychological therapies or whether it's psychic therapies and i was wondering how sh how she thinks about that great. and what would you tell a person who's looking for help great great question and 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 i would say let me put a little code on that and say i have seen psychics particularly help people with grief like really people are stuck in chronic grief can unresolved grief i've seen it help so i'll let you answer the rest yes absolutely there have been a number of studies by the winbridge institute looking at grief and changes in grief from mediumistic reading so regardless of whether we can prove if they're really talking to the deceased loved one or not people are getting benefit from having that cathartic communication. So I think that's really important to bring up. I love this question from the caller. I support people in strengthening their ability to go within and to tap into their own inner wisdom about what is right for them whether it is seeing a counselor and having one-on-one -on -one therapy, whether it is connecting with a, you know, like you mentioned, psychic or medium, et cetera, for support in the context of internal guidance. So that doesn't mean that we're projecting our authority outside of ourselves and always looking outside of ourselves for the answers, but being able to cultivate the ability to become still, to become quiet, and look within and build your ability to trust that information that you receive, whether it shows up as an idea or an image or a feeling in your body. One of the simplest exercises that I talk about in my book to begin your practice around this is to just take a few minutes a day 
to do some nice deep breathing, to get fully present and ask a question, then just notice what you receive. Is your body kind of feeling more shut down and closed? Does it feel more open and expanded? And so that's one simple exercise you can do to choose what's best for you. And it may be that today it's better for you to go see the counselor and a month from now it may be better for you to have a psychic session in addition to that. So it really is an individual process and yet this idea of strengthening our ability to go within and tap into our inner guidance, I've seen over and over and over again supporting uh, so many people, reducing anxiety, reducing depression, increased quality of life, increased meaning in their life, and just feeling more relaxed because they aren't banging their heads against the wall for every decision in their life. Let, let's on wrap on up with that. the... I, I know I can I can tell and and people have to and, and to, to if they want more should they go to your website where where should they go? They should get my book The Science of Channeling. You can also go to our website noetic.org. We have uh, webinars every Friday at eleven a.m. that go deeply into our science and our experience. We have a whole experience department as well. Um, that gives people opportunities to practice and learn these things. Let, let me end with kind of a global question. I, I have noticed, well, certainly I've been dealing with for the last 20 or 30 years, what uh, my patients call the spiritual vacuum in America. And I feel like not only has there been a spiritual vacuum, which I'm not really sure what that means, but but patients talk about it with great vividness. and Lately, I've noticed there's just immense negativity. Like negativity is sort of sweeping the land. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas or solutions or sort of how we should all be battling back to try to to try to create thriving. Uh, if we are inter all interconnected in some way, it, it feels like we need to all start rowing in a positive, towards the positive pole and not the negative pole so much. Am I on to anything? And do you have anything to say about that? I do. And it really comes from, you know, I'm also a meditator and a meditation teacher. And, you know, through meditation, through mindfulness, through bringing our awareness to the present moment, you find that even in the most incredibly difficult times, we can find moments of joy, moments of gratitude, moments of compassion. And even if it's just for a second, that brief glimpse supports us in being positive. And I don't want to talk about positivity as this fake kind of Pollyanna thing. Being able to have uh, kindness, and love towards ourselves, compassion towards ourselves and others around us, even when things can look really ugly and really challenging and really difficult. But being aware of where we're at in each moment allows us to find those kernels of joy and laughter and love amidst it all and allows us to, I think, choose from a place of um, conscious responding rather than being in this reactionary kind of fight or flight mode, which, as you well know, shuts down our frontal lobe, has us make really bad decisions and makes things even more negative. So if I could give Amen. any advice, it would be to just take a couple minutes a day, nice deep breaths, Focus on yourself. Ask, where am I at in this moment? What do I need to do for my next best step to create thriving in my own life? And there's just so many incredible resources to support people to do that. And I talk a lot about them in my book, The Science of Channeling. Well, Dr. Alane Wabe, thank you. Interesting conversation. I totally agree. For more, get book the book. And uh, Susan, any any last minute? 
No, I get it. I I hear her and I I agree with her. And I, you know, it, whether you're going to a psychologist or you're going to a psychic and you're getting, you know, sort of love and light and information that makes you feel better about what your decisions are going to be. Um, that's the good part. Like most of the, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, I don't want to go to a psychic cause I don't want to know if I'm going to die. And it's like, no, well, psychics don't tell you good psychics don't give you the bad news, you know, like, Oh, you're going to die or your, or your, your husband's cheating on you or whatever, you know, unless you really want that sort of intuition, they, they're trying to build up your, the love in your heart and the things that you can use to move forward in a happy way. The, the only, that's my yeah, take on it. At I least understand. the psychics I work with. And, and I would, you know, I would emphasize the compassion piece that, that it really being communing with others to me is a big piece. Yeah. That's and it's just, that's sort of disconnected there's some kind right of now. collective consciousness that we can all have, you know, with this kind of information. P positively. Not yeah, I mean, the so weird. Fun. Say it again. Yeah, we're so bombarded. We're so bombarded these days with social media and the news, and it's just often spewing fear, it's negativity, like etc. It's really easy to feel, you know, overwhelmed with all of that. And so part of it is, I think, just turning off a little bit and going within and sourcing your own sense of groundedness within yourself instead of all this negativity around us. Yeah, and, and spirituality I've always, is good for and, that. And I've always had the instinct that when something is negative, it could be also used for positive. That's why I got involved in radio back in 1983. I just it was such a negative force at the time. I thought, eh, should be able to be turned in a positive direction. And I, and I just for the first moment hearing you speak, I wrote down the word delight. And there's no reason why we couldn't find delight in some of the social media exposure rather than disgust and anger, which is what we're sort of steeped in. So look for delight. All right, Dr. Wabe, thank you so much for joining us and uh, good luck with the book. And we look forward to more from you. Thank you so much. Take care. Um, yes, good conversation. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Susan, you happy with that one? Yeah, Susan's, that was good. So we, Susan wanted to make sure we got in Dr. Wabe and Julia tomorrow before she leaves for New Orleans. We're going to be away uh, f after tomorrow for about a week. We'll yeah. be back for shows on Thursday and Friday. Don't forget to sign up for the Hillsides uh, benefit. Um, which is coming this weekend, yeah. which is uh -huh. this weekend. I sent uh, the link. Yep, good. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, interesting conversation. Uh, Julia Trublinka tomorrow to talk about, there she is, uh, talk about her experience on Night of Fiance. But also want to give her a chance to talk about the, the Russian perspective on what's going on in Ukraine. I'm trying to get hold some of the other women who are Ukrainian to get their perspective. I just think it's an interesting hook. Not enough, I don't know, regular people ringing in on that topic. I, and I can't tell from the press. I personally, I don't trust anything coming out of the news because I've seen how horribly yeah. they distorted all the COVID information. So now I've lost trust in everything. Uh, so I don't know what to believe, what not to believe. Right. I'd be interested to hear so, what a real so person. So Drew, has to I want to say I have a I have the wood floor guy outside, so I got to run. But okay. tell me why when I do my show and I and I and we do the psychic medium work yeah. and we show it. Yeah. So many people that follow you like to yell at me or yell at you and and say like this is charlatan work and you're you know you're a quack and you shouldn't ha let your wife be on your platform and you're kind of you know this is all fake and or all whatever right. and what's what, the question why is it that when you talk about it like this from a scientific view it's okay but when you actually see somebody who does it you think it's all you know hocus pocus and and it's I not think, real. And... Let, let me let me give it. Let me let me give the the most. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of un unsympathetic view I can of what is happening and why people get upset. Let's say it is a real thing, and let's say it has a materialistic basis to it, and we figure it out. I think people feel like it's somehow exploiting some mechanism yeah. you know for people but we that's, bring that's, that's we, the most unsympathetic thing we I can make say. people feel like I they know. have closure and we I give them it, look i've seen it work on grief love and, and we give i'm it, fascinated we, by it we're not coming from an 
a bad place. We're kind of we're trying to help people. Uh, but I think it goes. I mean, I had to stop during the pandemic because we were already taking enough shit about you know. We'll bring it back. Let's see what people say. I, I think. I mean, I, I think, think people are more open to it now because they want to know what the future is and they have no yeah, but nothing to go by and they're or they're want to this connect to their the, loved ones. This is where you get the and, trouble when you do when you speak to. Um, dogmatically about what you're seeing. I've had hearing. some amazing you, readings you, you, that I know, have but come true. If you true. were to say, interesting, maybe, you know, use use more qualifiers right. than, than like the, it is so, I think yeah, people would be I'm more Yeah, but then I'm insulting receptive. the psychic. I mean, they're, I, that's what they do for a living. They're I, good I at it. I understand, and it's up to the subject to decide what and they want to do with it. And nothing is in stone. Like, you know, it's, it's open for interpretation. I've had your psychic friends speak in doubts about some of the things they've seen. They, they're in disbelief. Some right, of the things they right. See. So, so... But I just you know, wonder why I, we get like because it's so not, many people that are. I mean, it, it's more male. You know, they're like, I can't believe you're doing this. This is so. Well, I, 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 you're better I'm, than this, Doctor Drew. In Clubhouse, nobody stayed. Everyone dropped off. No one wanted to hear about it. So yeah. there's certainly a, no. I get it. It's 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 more for the female audience. Clearly, it but, is. You're you're you're. Tr as, as long as I don't know how to. How I mean, to, I had a lot of followers. I had a lot of shows. No, like it's it. interesting. It's entertaining. It's fascinating. But but you, you can't go too far with it without people feeling like there's an exploitive element in it. I think that's yeah. what happens. Uh, and I think that's okay. Well, that's, but you, those your rate job, better. The more exciting. Your job. Itself. Well, those are more exciting, right? But your job is to figure out how to frame it so people don't feel that way. I mean, that's what you ought to do. You ought to be very. I did upfront a good job. It. I had. I people didn't. I mean, there was just a lot of people that were kind of, I don't like being called crazy for producing shows where I'm letting psychics do their work. A lot of people want it. They they love it. Well, so it, it don't be people like to attack things I mean, I they don't lot understand because things they don't understand make them uncomfortable. So then people kind of get a little, but, like, but scared no, of but too, Caleb, I don't you know? think it's that simple. I, don't I think, think it's, it's that both simple. ways. I think, yeah. I think they, they're afraid of people being exploited by it. things they don't understand too. You know, it's, they think, well, they would be so and easy to exploit that, someone you, if if they fall into something that are where they can't. Hard to find. prove, right? Exactly, exactly. Caleb likes hard to my prove. show, <laughs> right? Right. So you, no, I get, Caleb, you I understand both ways. Bring this thing back. Okay, yeah. you and Susan bring this thing back, and, and yeah, but if I do it on my own platform, there'll be three hundred viewers. You know, no, we'll, but if I do we'll it on your it, platform, Susan. I'll have no, five thousand no. viewers. Well, I would argue that people now have a relationship with you as well yeah. on this platform, and so they kind of know who you are. You're not some, you know, Macbethian witch out there. You know, you know what I'm saying? No, they, but they kind people of, have they, called me nuts, so I know that. I don't. I don't. I don't really care. But but, um, but I think you have enough. No, I just wonder, like, if you're if you're you're talking to a woman like this that wrote a book about it and has taken a scientific approach to it, how that's okay. But when I actually so show somebody who does this for a living and helps people every day, well, it's also not my thing, and it's not consistent. Yeah, but you've with been on—you were on fifty percent of my shows, I, getting readings, and you I were have like a wife astounded. that wanted me to help, and I was fascinated <laughs> by it. And I made a study of it, and I've started, and, and that study I talked about today, and it has some. Basis no, I know, to it. and well, I get it. I love it. I and it so, makes me want to do it again because I love I love doing it. You might be yeah. on a have a good idea there as well. It's like maybe we balance it out where we have one psychic and also one researcher that's on the shows at the same time to balance things out because then I, yeah. think, people I get think the both way sides. you do it, I think the way to do it, you, you literally bring somebody like Dr. Wabe on at the beginning to frame it and then you do your thing. Yeah, and, and right, do exactly. Whatever, and people can take take what they want from it. But, but I right. think I think you're in a much better position now. No, it just Susan, you know Susan, I Susan, let me finish. I don't because know, of your a lot of work. because <laughs> It's a different issue. I mean, that woman's not going to sell because, that many books because people aren't. Because ha it's not a big audience, a very niche audience. Not like I'm going to set the world on fire with this. Your mom's house and Doctor Drew After Dark. I think uh -huh. people have a better understanding of you and our relationship. Yeah, and are going to be much more open. To yeah, but they're going to yes, call you 100%. names. I don't, I don't like that. I don't like. They do that every day. They're going to call me names. Or the, the, they're going to call, call you names. names. They call Drew names every day. I see it on Twitter all day. It, you know, they're gonna they're <laughs> gonna they're gonna call the names they want to call. <laughs> you married a crazy woman. No, I'm Thank I'm goodness. a little psychic. Okay, I am 
I am. I'm sorry. The the wood floor guy's here, okay. so I got to right. go. But okay. I'm also ambidextrous, and I have I psychic abilities, I so I know what that means. I don't. And I don't I've choose some, to do it. I I've been in some very deep to. situations with patients where I've had w uncanny experiences, so I know uncanny experiences are possible. Now, can I explain them, or do I want to, you know, de depart from materialism to explain them? No, I don't. But I don't object to people doing so. It's up to them. I mean, so thanks, Matt S. He said, Susan's vulnerability on the subject makes me more open to it. Thank you. I'm not and Buddy trying says, to sell F it. what people think. So let the, Susan, you'll have Buddy watching if nobody Yeah, knows. I kind of want to bring it back. <laughs> I mean, I think it's more people are more open to it than when I started it five or six years ago. And, you know, I think that people are understanding it a little bit better. And... and, and um, you know, two of me in a marriage would not work. <laughs> Let's put it that way. We, we, she and I need to be very different for this to be a long-term success. Uh, not, I'm not saying that you have to be opposite or you have to be as far away from your partner as possible. But when you're super intense like I am, another super intense person, we, we would drive each other absolutely, bad, absolutely batty. And by the same token, two people with heads in the clouds We'll not get things done. <laughs> we'll That's not, we'll true. not go very well. Either. I don't know why we're together. Um, it's so amazing. But uh, I didn't get a chance. We we had to get. Um, don't forget this week of the episode of Doctor You After Dark. I I am on there again. You know, I you, actually listened to it, and I remember how funny it is now. It really so listen funny. to After Dark, Susan. Susan, <laughs> I, I just remember came away stunned. I remember I, being I sort of out of body. I have to get the front door though. So okay, but one question before we start up. Let's get somebody who can talk about the mysticism of numbers because there is a mysticism okay. around numbers, and that's a very interesting thing. Michelle can probably. Hook if anybody up. has any recommendations, uh, con contact doctor.com tomorrow, two o'clock with uh, Julia Treblinka from 90 Day Fiance. If you're a fan of that show, you'll like this conversation. And we're going to get into the average person's view, her family's view in Russia of what's going on in the Ukraine. We'll see you tomorrow too. I love whenever I have a stomach ache and he goes, you're probably going to have diarrhea. And then like two minutes later, I, I, he's like psychic about diarrhea. It's like, I have this weird feeling. Yep, he is. He's the diarrhea whisperer. He's always right. <laughs> Dr. Diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, guys. Have your fun. <laughs>Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.